Thanks a lot, Tim, and, and thanks for the, the opportunity uh, to, to present. Uh, I've got a presentation here that um, steps through uh, why, why we like uh, resources at the moment, the opportunity that we see in resources and, and um, yeah, a bit, bit of a high level thoughts on, on the key commodities that we're, we're gaining exposure to. But um, maybe just as a quick intro as to, as to who I am, um, like Tim highlighted, myself and a colleague run, run the Global Resources Fund here at, um, at Ausbill. You know, we've approached um, investing in resources you know, slightly differently, um, you know, starting with the fact that we invest in, you know, in, in the global space, but you know, really we've come at things from a, a long short perspective so that we can uh, you know, aim to generate absolute returns through, through the cycle. Uh, like I said, we see a real opportunity at the moment, but just, um, you know, be, being able to you know, run you know, portfolio net short through periods um, where it's weaker, like we saw you know, through last year, is, is you know, just just enables us to to approach things you know, in what is you know, continues to be a, a cyclical um, you know, cyclical uh, you know, sort of space. Um, you know, the fund's been around for the last three years, for the last twelve months, you know, including you know, up until. Uh, you know, February of this year and, and including obviously March, which was uh, COVID of last year, you know, we've generated roughly 88% net returns on an absolute basis. So it sort of just reinforces that, you know, a slightly different approach to, to resources, you know, a slightly tweaked approach to resources, how we've come at things and, and it's been highly successful. But as we step to the, the next slide, I'm, I'm going to sort of step you through why we like resources. You know, you, you would have read you know, plenty of articles lately that are talking about, you know, we're entering the, the resources super cycle and, and look, uh, we'd agree with that. Um, you know, we see a real opportunity in resource at the moment. Um, you know, if we, if we, you know, sort of step through the key components, you know, we start with demand. You know, Chinese demand really accelerated post the COVID related lockdowns, um, uh, you know, significantly, um, you know, through the course of last year, they, they resorted back to construction related uh, activity, which is you know, commodity intensive. You know, what we're seeing is the rest of the world is starting to come through. Vaccine is really you know, being quite you know, successful. It's enabling you know, you know, sort of, uh, the rest of the world to get back to work and you know, an unprecedented level of, of um, you know, fiscal and monetary stimulus, which is really gonna accelerate activity. And at the same time, you know, the supply side is, is really waning and, and um, there's been a lack of investment for the last decade that really tightened up the resources space. So you know, it's, a, it's a little bit different to prior cycles that we've seen in, in, in resources, but you know, see it as um, you know, really a, you know, just at the start of, of a super cycle within resources. So look, I, I might step through some of these key components. You know, talking about China, lot like a highlighter, you can see the dip at, you know, at the start of last year in the it's the red line there, you know, construction you know, activity really accelerated up out of, um, you know, the COVID lockdowns that they had in March and, and um, the importance of, of China to, to resources is, is important to call out. You know, it's, it's roughly 50% of demand on, on average and, and um, you know, re really, you know, sort of, you know, the, the, the country putting the foot down in terms of activity levels is, is, this, is the backbone for commodities demand. And then as we move to the next slide, you know, again, reinforces that this isn't just about China this time around, that prior cycles have been all about China. This is about the rest of the world as well. You know, unprecedented levels of stimulus that feeds into very strong commodities demand. And, and you, know, you wouldn't realise it from mainstream media, but that the impact that, that the vaccine is having to enabling um, you know, sort of the, the world to get back to work is um, is really going to enable this this stimulus to hit the ground pretty hard from a from a uh, commodities demand perspective. Then, as we move to the next slide again, like I touched on, you know, supply. Um, you know, we've seen a lack of investment in in, in new supply La last year with the disruptions that we saw play out in South America around COVID, particular in copper and iron ore, you know, really highlight of how tight this market is. You know, we saw. You know, copper, you know, double from its lows in, in March. And, and that's happened because the market is extremely tight and with these, these issues that played out in, in Chile and Peru, which dominate um, the market. And that's not going away anytime soon. You know, similarly, iron ore, you can see it at 160, 170, a range of issues in Brazil. But again, you know, the, the, the demand backdrop is, is extremely supportive. And, you know, we move to the next slide, you know, sort of reinforces why 
and chart the left highlights for the last decade. We've seen a lot, lack of investment in new supply for, for um, you know, commodities related projects. And it's just meant that, that um, the production volumes that we need, the, the volumes from, from uh, for any of these sort of broader commodities, are just aren't keeping up with the, with the demand growth that's coming through. So as we roll to the next slide again, you know, this sort of reinforces you know, how commodity cycles or resources cycles play out that they're, um, you know, we're getting some discussions that resources have run hard, you know, since since the, the latter part of COVID and, and uh, you know, some people suggesting that, that um, you know, maybe they've gone too hard. You know, re resources cycles don't run in months, they run in years. You know, stocks have a very strong, you know, sort of backdrop in terms of their performance. You know, we're not highlighting that we're back to that the cycle that we saw that was dominated by, by China 10 years ago. But like I said, there's a very positive backdrop Demand is very strong and improving, you know, will continue to improve on the back of, um, you know, the stimulus. And, and at the same time, um, you know, like I highlighted, the supply is not there. You've got currency weakness. You've got a debasement of the US dollar, which is similarly, you know, supportive for, um, for uh, commodities. And, and at the same time, you know, this discussion around inflation at the moment and, and the uncertainty around inflation or the likelihood that inflation starts to play out, you know, really plays into the hands of, of um, commodities more broadly, um, you know, gold, but, but the broader commodities com complex performs well with that backdrop. And then as we move to, to the next slide, you know, this will just give you, you know, some high level, you know, thoughts on, on how we're positioned from a fund management perspective at the moment in terms of the fund that, that I run. You know, you can see you know, the chart on the right, it's just showing that the net exposure in aggregate for, for the fund and it sort of highlights that with long base metals, long copper in particular, and really that's a discussion like a highlight lack of investment, but the recovery of the rest of the world, recovery in demand, you know, around these sort of light, later cycle commodities. Um, we're long oil and gas on a similar discussion. Um, you know, oil seen a lack of investment since um, late 14, and, and uh, we see a real opportunity as transportation related demand you know accelerates as, as the, the world comes out of its um, you know, sort of uh, issues around COVID with long batch of materials it's been a real change for the portfolio over the last six months we see a real opportunity in batch of materials there's um, you know it's not only just a discussion around China you know the, the European green stimulus has fed into electric vehicle you know, penetration accelerating at a significant rate and that feeds into you know, direct commodities exposure in lithium graphite, but it also feeds into discussion around these these um, these uh, you know, base metals commodities as well, in, in nickel and cop copper as well, which are also be benefit from that backdrop. So, well, like I said, that's a pretty quick run through as to why we're bullish on the outlook for resources. Like I said, we, we run a, a long short fund, you know, so we can. You know, you know, sort of benefit in, in, you know, through the cycle. But at the moment, you know, we see a real opportunity playing out in this space. We're targeting towards, you know, sort of consumer-related commodities um, because that's where we see the, the best opportunities. And, you know, using some of those construction-related commodities, if it's iron ore, net coal or otherwise, as sort of the funding source to, you know, really target some of the beta that we see in this space. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, I think you're finished there, but I've um, got lots of questions actually. And um, firstly, there's a lot going on in the market, a lot going on in the sector. How many sort of placements and, and uh, IPO opportunities you're seeing in this market at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's coming thick and fast. Um, yeah, and, and that's the, I guess, the, the point around you know, the supply response is, is that you know, clear, clearly there's a lot of capital raisings to move projects forward. Last year, it was probably the gold space that we saw a significant amount of um, opportunities in, in, in uh, you know, from a capital raising perspective. This year, it feels like it's been more uh, batch materials. You know, we're, we're very active in that space as well. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of opportunities come through on, on uh, the capital raising side of things. You know, probably, like, like I said, targeting in towards batch materials a little bit more this year and seeing some opportunities come through from that perspective. Yeah, what, what, what would that mean from a supply response? Um, it still will take time for, for the dollars to, to result in, in volumes coming through, but, but it highlights that we've got a very active space and, and there's a lot of interest in the market um, you know, to, to support new projects that, that haven't been supported for some time, that um, 
Now, there's been a real lack of investment for the last decade, and that's why we're seeing you know, the amount of capital raisings that we've come, you know, coming through. It also feeds into the services space as well. Right? There's a lot of activity drilling, a lot of activity from mining services as, as well, and that's a space we can play as well. But uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of activity definitely at the moment, and uh, there's a lot of appetite in certain areas for, for investors as well. And, and just from a portfolio management perspective, I mean, some of those stocks have rallied 500% since the start of the year. Do, are you kind of forced to trade those positions? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think this space requires active management is, is the key point that I'd reinforce is that, um, again, coming back to the structure of this fund, it, you know, it, it is long short. It's not just a long only fund that just buys and holds and, and, um, and uh, you know, just wears the cycle. You know, we, we're, um, you know, we're quite active in terms of our positioning um, uh, you know, we will, you know, turn the, per the portfolio over to, to, you know, sort of get the, the quick wins as, as they come through and, and lock those sort of wins in. But at the same time, you know, some of these stocks are recovering from lows that um, they shouldn't have been at to begin with, right? Some of these lithium names were just on the nose. No one would own them. And, and all of a sudden they're recovering back. They may have doubled or tripled, but you know, you see a real opportunity that, that these stocks can continue on as well, right? That we think we're just at the early stages of, of um, this rally. And, you know, for some of these commodities, you, you're seeing price strength, which supports earnings. You're seeing volumes recovery, which supports earnings and valuation, obviously. You're seeing expansions beyond that, which, you know, similarly will support valuation as well. So like I said, you know, we, we, some of these stocks, or like you said, some of these stocks have performed extremely well, but... You know, they're recovering from the lows of the cycle and there's a lot, you know, I'm summarising here, right? There's sort of a lot of commodities to talk through, but there's a lot of opportunities that are supporting both earnings and valuation that, um, you know, we continue to see, you know, opportunities as you, as you can see with with um, with our positioning. And, and um, from a research perspective, do you start with a particular uh, commodity or do you start at the company level? Yeah, look, so, so we start with a commodity. We start with the top down, and we do a, have a view on 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 the macro. We you know sort of you know sort of uh, we're fully you know tied in with the broader Ausbuild team. So we've got a chief economist that outlines a, a view around the, the macro that we all debate. That feeds into our commodity view. You know the two of us that, that run the fund you know, do all the work on on the commodity. You know what we're finding in terms of the the um, sell side now. There's been a a real lack of investment in, in commodities research. So there's a lot of alpha that can be generated by targeting in you know, doing the work on the commodities. You know, last year, that would have been iron ore, you know, you know, doing the travel, getting over to Brazil when we couldn't the year prior, you know, really doing the work on the commodities. And then from there, we can narrow the universe of the stocks available to us because we're a global mandate. You know, we can target the best global opportunities within that commodity. Copper is an example. If you want to own Australia, you know, there's a there's a limited amount of copper stocks that you can own. You know, we got a much larger universe, potentially, you know, better valuations overseas, you know, better growth will, will lend us to own the, the North American names. This is a summary, but you know, we start with a macro and then we narrow the universe in to, to find the best global opportunities within those commodities. And, and your net exposure can be reduced because you, you short sell. Do you, do you use short selling as, as a way to reduce risk? De definitely. Um, you know, so, so risk is core to this fund. Well, like I said, we, we've had to come at things a little bit differently or we have come at things a little bit differently from a, an investment in resources. Um, you know, the short's one aspect We've got other ways that, that we, we manage risk across the, the portfolio in general. You know, a good example, you know, in terms of the shorting, you know, we may not have a strong view on the commodity, but we might like a stock from a bottom-up perspective. You know, we'll try and, you know, like we'll own, we'll own it on the long side and, and we'll try and you know, reduce risk, remove the commodity risk by you know, shorting a, a lower beta you know, commodity, you know, equity exposure to try and you know, reduce risk, you know, say gold, for example. But um, you know, the shorting we see as a way to manage risk, 
and then there's other ways that, that um, you know, we're protecting the portfolio just to ensure that um, we can manage through volatile periods like we've been investing in you know, COVID last year, if, that, if that's not a, a volatile investment climate for, uh, for all spaces, but resources in general, well, it's sort of highlighted the structure we've got both on the shorts and, and the broader protection of the portfolios is the, the right approach in the space. And, and we're seeing a lot of uh, um, investment mandates influenced by ESG principles. I mean, lithium being a, a classic example where you've got the spodumene, probably dirtier lithium producers compared to some of the, the, the cleaner players in, in South America, for example. D does that influence your decision making? D definitely. Yeah. So, so there's two ways we look at ESG. One's the top down, you know, and, and as the... You know, longer term or the medium term impact you know, on, on commodities, you know, structurally challenged fossil fuels, the benefit that new metals or base metals will get as we see energy transition. And then you know, the component that you sort of highlight, the, the bottom up side of things is, is how we also look at ESG. We, we look at ESG from the perspective of making better informed in, investment decisions you know, uh, some, some good examples, maybe not the one that you're highlighting, but safety performance, great lead indicator as to how a mine is being operated. You know, having a look at safety performance, governance, similarly, you know, views around, you know, boards and management teams you know, will, will greatly influence our, our views on, on companies more broadly and, and therefore, you know, the, the ESG view on, on a company. And, and to your point around spodumene or, or otherwise, you know, definitely, yeah, the, the way that we look at um, you know, ESG is just making you know, better informed in investment decisions about how we're going to allocate uh, capital within the portfolio. And, and just quickly, there's a couple of questions on, on Battery Day. What, what were your thoughts there? Yeah, uh, Battery Day, like VW uh, ha having a power day, it's incredible, right? And you know, yeah. <laughs> clearly Tesla having one before that, as, you, as you'd expect. But um, look, there's a couple of points to make about electric vehicles and you know, the, 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 the first component is this was just a China story four years ago. The reason that it, it, it went through the cycle that it did was it was based on China subsidies, driving demand, supply responded, and, and we've been in the lows of the cycle. Last year, China demand recovered in terms of EV, um, and then Europe, you know, coming back to battery day, European demand exploded last year. Green stimulus really accelerated um, EV penetration Longer term, there's a discussion around around the US as well, but um, you know that Euro European penetration, you know, discussion around the VW Power Day, you know, really reinforced you know what VW themselves are trying to do. The, the demand growth is is exponential. The supply can't keep up at this stage. We'll go through m multiple um, you know sort of cycles like like we we've seen before where supply overreacts, but at the moment. You know, the, the reaction from a demand perspective, the, the supply side and the, and the supply chain just is not set up for the level of demand that we're seeing for lithium, for graphite, and then ultimately for, for the you know, secondary commodities, you know, such as you know, nickel and, and copper, like I highlighted.